All right. Well, it is. Yeah, it's about it's afternoon now, so we should probably go ahead and get started. Oh, OK. Um, we I got could. some people probably still going to be trickling in, but it is Friday, so I imagine we'll have a slightly lower attendance today. Um, I, today, we're going to be talking about animal damage with Ken Bevis. I'm sure many of you know Ken Bevis. Um, he's a, a great guy and also uh, uh, somebody that we rely on a lot at WCU Extension. So keeps, um, me, empl keeps me employed, Patrick. Thank you. Right. <laughs> yeah, you definitely have job security uh, with us. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> so a uh, lot to cover today, I'm sure. I'll, I'll just hand it over to you, Ken. Cool. Okay. Well, um, I understand that the lunchtime seminars here have been about uh, trying to grow trees more or less from scratch in, um, you know, forestry settings. And so that's the, the aim of this because animal damage could go lots of different directions. So um, this was, this is a shorter version of the webinar we did last spring, but I would call it a dang it, who chewed my tree? So here we go. Um, let's see if I can make this work. That didn't work. That didn't work. Hey, PowerPoint, talk to me. So this is me. Oh, you can see me there. We're going to show you a few pictures. That's Zobris that runs Patrick's programs. And Kevin's a real smart guy. Uh, but there's Patrick. And Patrick is smarter than both of those guys. So that's supposed to be why we have a humorous introduction. And throwing you a bone there, Patrick. There you go. Um, so, and I work for the Department of Natural Resource Forest Stewardship Program. That's Matt Preventure right there. Uh, Julie's retired, but that's a nice picture. And so we help people write your stewardship plans, your cost shares. We give advice on whatever you might ask. And many of, uh, I know some of our participants have worked with us, but there's our contact information. So if you have small forest lands and uh, we might be able to help you, there we are. Patrick's part of our team and, um, we, uh, we try to help and um, we like what we do. So there you go. All right. So, you know, remember ecology, uh, the whole notion of photosynthesis, the way that the planet works and everything. And plants uh, through photosynthesis are the basis of most of our ecology. And there's a lot of animals that eat plants. So we have to remember that because most animals ultimately, no, all animals pretty much ultimately are dependent on plants and forests are made out of plants. Okay, so there you go. And wildlife, indeed is one of the great benefits of owning forest land. So whenever we do the values survey, uh, wildlife, providing wildlife habitat is always in like the top three, four, number four, number three, number two of people's values. So that's an important thing to remember as we start to consider uh, animal damage. So here we go. So the presentation outline, I'm going to speak a little bit about good versus bad wildlife, study the situation, what could the problem be, and what do you do? And here's some examples and options for dealing with wildlife damage, particularly on young trees. So good wildlife are the things that we like, you know, the ones we like. Um, uh, bad, uh, we don't like them because they take something from us. So like, let's use the example of bald eagles. You know, bald eagles eat dead fish and rotting things on the beach. And we think they're really noble and cool and everything until they grab your little dog. Then suddenly the same animal is bad or back to the deer. You know, and so in forestry settings, the forestry bads are usually deer, sometimes elk, uh, rodents like voles, beavers, or black bears that damage and eat the plants that we desire, our trees in this case. And there's a few others. So that's what I'm going to speak to today. And so when you're dealing with an animal damage uh, circumstance, this is what I mean, it's kind of a, a science-y uh, approach, but, you know, really look at what are they affecting, you know, what kind of trees, how big, how are they affecting them, how much is it being affected, and these are things, things to look at. Is there really damage, and, you know, I mean, actually look at it hard and say, okay, what what is the damage, and uh, what, uh, how much, and then look at how much there is and determine your threshold for action. Even if it's just like, oh man, they ate my favorite tree. I got to do something about it. And so, you know, this is a, a generalized uh, approach, but uh, <clears throat> we're going to wind up at the far end looking at all these. So 
you know, what kind of damage do you see? And usually uh, when we're dealing with younger trees, it's going to be some kind of a chewing, uh, perhaps uh, browsing of the tips. Uh, is it girdled all the way around? You know, has it been scuffed on? Um, did it kill the trees? Did it actually result in mortality like this girdling on a Douglas fir uh, sapling? Uh, here's another one right here. This is actually an elk did this to a young tree. Um, rodents tend to chew and go through the through the bark into the cambium, often down low uh, on the sim. Or if they've nipped the vegetation, it's like as if a pair of scissors did it because they have incisors on the top and the bottom. Um, let's see, how did I go? There we go. Um, deer don't have, a lot of people know this, but there's no incisors in elk too. They don't have any teeth on the top front of their jaw. So uh, this is a bad skull to show this, but right out here, there's no teeth. So they have teeth on the bottom. So they basically uh, tear the tip. So like this isn't a, well, you can kind of see it. See, it's kind of torn. So elk, uh, deer and elk will tear like that. Yeah, there you go. Like that's torn. If a rodent had done that, it would have looked like it was cut with a knife. Um, so you got to be a detective. You got to look for clues like these to help you know what it is that you're dealing with. And frankly, many times you'll see it. Somebody will actually see it going on. So how much damage is there? How do you assess the effect on your uh, your trees? You know, and, and again, I'm assuming that we're we're really speaking to uh, small forest landowners who are attempting to grow. Um, you know, a crop of trees or to have a healthy forest with well stocked stands. So what is your stand condition and what is your desired stocking, you know, down the road? You know, where are you going? So like this is a clear cut out by Shelton that was planted with Douglas fir. And Patrick, you could give me an off the cuff here too, but that's right now is probably somewhere in the order of 400 trees per acre. Uh, it's, I mean, that's really dense. Look, the crowns are closing in. Well, shoot, your, your final stock on this stand if you did a series of thinnings would be about 120. So you're going to wind up with a lot, lot less trees. So how do you assess this? Well, I mean, obviously you can walk around, you know, and what happens is we will see evidence of damage and it becomes much larger in our minds than collectively it all is. I mean, that's just the way that our brains work. It's like, wow, look at that. So you want to keep some notes. You want to, you want to keep track of how much there really is relative to the whole stand. And you have to ask yourself, is that enough information? Remember back to the beginning to reach a decision. Okay, I, am I going to do something about this? Yes or no. And so one really good way if you had a young, say like a plantation setting like this is you might actually go out and take some plots. You know, you, like we, we, we like to advocate uh, in coach planning and things for people to go out and do fixed uh, radius plots using a piece of string or something and you keep track. And so a hundredth of an acre plot would be a good way to assess your levels of mortality in a setting like this. That's like a, 11 feet in diameter. Um, how many are dead? How many are injured? You know, literally count them. Because you might you might have some trees that have been girdled, um, and this would give you a, a much better feeling of what's going on out there. So the bad animal number one, a number one bad actor, and you know deer are beautiful. They're elegant. We like to watch them. Some of us like to hunt them, and in general, deer are considered a positive presence. But when they start eating your trees, they can really make you upset. And the black-tailed deer and the mule deer are the same species, um, black-tailed being the west side, obviously. And probably the black-tail and the white-tail are the two biggest culprits in regard to eating young trees. But they all have a similar habit. So here's something about deer. You probably know this, but they're browsers. They're not grazers. So they, they, they'll eat some grass, but they mostly eat a shrub and sometimes trees, depending on the seasonality. Uh, so like a, an interesting timing thing, because they will shift what they're browsing on based on the, the, uh, the, the vegetation, what the status of it. And so watch, if you ever get a chance to watch a deer browse, they'll go through and they'll eat a little bit of this, and then they'll move over and eat a little bit of that. Then they'll, then they'll go back to the one that they really liked and eat a little bit more of that. And they will go through 
the the habitat and take a few steps and they know which things they like now well here's is an example in eastern washington and probably true in western too they'll eat little teeny douglas fir seedlings in the late winter when there is hardly anything else around and so um they're but they're browsers so de deer are i think this is part of why they're the biggest culprit elk are mostly grazers meaning they eat grasses and live uh, in areas where they can get down at the ground like like things in the hotel parking lot in packwood um but they'll also do some browsing and one thing with elk is when they want to eat something they eat it they, they just go for it so what we want to keep them from doing is eating the tip of the tree. We don't want like this one that a deer hit right here. Um, we want to let that part of the tree get high enough that they can't reach it. And something about uh, most of these deer is they can't stand up on their back legs independently. Sometimes they can, but they, they can't like, you know, reach without leaning on something and they tend not to and if you ever see a place where there's a browse line where there's so many deer like out on the san juans is a great example there'll be a line you can see the line in the forest which basically is how high a deer reaches while it's just standing there so we want to prevent them from getting the tips of the trees. And these Vexar tubes are an armoring technique. They cost about 75 cents each. Most of us have, have heard of these things. Um, they're your basic forestry supplier, uh, you know, uh, toolkit thing. Um, and uh, uh, you put them in with a little bamboo stake right here. And what, what people do, oh, and, and they're a pain in the butt. This is Doug Stinson down there uh, near uh, Toledo. And they were putting them out on their planted cedars all over the place in the tree farm here. He had a little bamboo stake and he's going around like that. And this is uh, rest his soul, Ron um, over there at Crystal Lake. And what Ron would do, see of the big tall stake. So here's a suggestion. If you do decide to use Vexar tubes, use the tall stake because then you can move them up. And we were actually out there that day moving these things up. So here the deer had not gotten to the tip of this one yet. And he was just going to pull it up. And you don't really care if they eat the bottom. Once they once it gets up there, then there you go. Um, well, then that's back up here too. This is, this is a, an interesting point that some areas don't have high deer populations. So that's one element of this is do the deer eat your trees, yes or no? And in many parts of Western Washington, indeed they do. And it doesn't take very many deer to eat the top out of your seedling and you're out of business. Um, so yeah, um, you can use homemade cages. This is that hardware cloth stuff, two inches by four inches. This is a method that they actually used on, on our place. There's a Douglas fir tree right there um, after the fire. So those of you who know my backstory, our house almost burned down and had a little forest, all the trees burned up, all the bushes. But this is a, this is, I like this technique because this thing's about four feet high and you can reuse these cages and you'll have them. This guy was putting uh, chicken wire around planted trees right here. And um, that's kind of a pain, but I I'm sure it would work. But look, he had to put three stakes in on each one. So different ways to do it with your own homemade cages. I like this one from Mr. Zumstein over there in your country, Patrick. Uh, he used a bloody chain link fence. And man, I, he, I said, did that work? Oh yeah, that works. So there you go. Um, this fellow, Bob Hakai over by Spokane, he, he actually would, in his log units, he'd plant a tree and he would just put a brush pile around the tree and he maintained that that kind of the deer would just move on and not munch that tree so there's there's a little another way home way home way homemade way to do it um dip repellents chemical tactics you know and a lot of people there's a whole bunch of different ones out there um uh and there's i like to call them folk remedies when we would do this in coach planning, people would say like, well, I got some elephant dung or no lion pee, which is fine. Uh, Irish spring soap. Somebody told me that uh, dryer sheets hung out would work, you know, and I think it's true. Repellents can be good method for a small scale. And that's like for ornamentals, like in your yard, or if you don't have a lot of trees, but they have a fundamental problem. And that is you got to reapply them. And if you miss an application and in Western Washington, that's a huge issue because, you know, it rains over there quite a bit and it washes the stuff off. And if you miss an application, you're done. 
So there you go. So your your options for preventing brows really are some kind of armoring uh, or attempting repellents. Um, and a gauge of how many deer <laughs> there are in a community is go into the hardware store and see how many different kinds of deer repellents there are. And they all work. Uh, but I've heard several stories now where a certain one would work for a while in a certain place and then stop working. And it's almost like the deer decides, eh, it doesn't taste that bad. So anyway, so there you go. And I'm sure there's uh, lots of uh, experience about uh, repellents um, uh, in there. Uh, let's see, Bill asked if Vexar tubes are not forever. When do you remove? Yeah, remove them when the when the when the tree is tall enough and what what they supposedly break down under uv light over time um which apparently they do so yeah they're not forever you remove them as soon as the tree's tall enough to not need them anymore yep and that's a, a really good one patrick i said i wasn't gonna answer questions as i went but i just did so there's antlers this is a totally interesting so deer and elk uh, grow a new set of antlers every year. And this velvet on here is highly, um, what do you call it, uh, with lots of blood vessels and it's moving calcium from other parts of their body to literally grow a bone out of the top of their head for uh, reproductive season for fighting and display and everything. Well, in the late summer, um, the, uh, the velvet actually starts to die. And so when it's almost time, it was before the early uh, breeding season, this starts to get really itchy, apparently, and the deer rub it off. They've got to find some place to rub this, this thin veneer of fleshy, uh, soft, uh, uh, what's the word for lots of blood vessels? Um, oh, gosh, come on, somebody help me out here. Um, and... Uh, they got to do that. So what they really like to do is rub something that whips around some kind of tree. This is actually an elk rub right here, which is higher on a bigger tree. But the deer will rub about waist high and it'll be on uh, some kind of a small diameter flexible tree. They like some species better than others, but they'll use all kinds of different stuff. So you, you, know, you anticipate what would a deer need to do to rub that off and they would need room to get up in front of it. And I'm bending my head over pretending like I'm a deer. And if you've ever watched them do it, they like fight that tree, they knock it back and forth and everything. And they're all ornery and they're, they're not quite full of uh, rutting hormone yet, but they got to do that. And they do that usually in like September-ish, uh, it's early fall. So yeah, there you go. Um, and so how do you prevent that? Vascular tissue. Thank you, Jackie. Whew, that is the word I was looking for. Um, so how do you how do you prevent this if it's something that you're really worried about? Well, um, you know, I met a couple of people who actually would armor their trees. This is one that look at this trees out here in the open. And this family over on Whidbey, he put up a, a post right here then he did this because this didn't work so he did this and the deer couldn't get at it uh, this is actually one of my trees i had them tear up my pine trees that were they were being watered so they were growing really good here's our place again and i put the cages back on them because i thought they were high enough for the tree to grow well these bloody deer came in and wrecked my pine trees it's like oh man so another option is to decide which trees it's fine if they rub them and make it easier by just clearing out around them and say, okay, okay, Bucky, you get that one. That's just one thought, but you're not going to stop this behavior um, <clears throat> and it's going to happen. And so, you know, when you run into it, there it is. Oh, Patrick, I'm going to have to crank through this. So I'm going to be a little cursory, but a um, special case is bear damage on young Douglas fir trees. <laughs> and it's like, what? Bears damaging trees? Come on, hey, Smokey, say it ain't so, but yeah, it is. And every now and then, black bears will discover this uh this food source in the early spring where they tear the bark off of, of sapling sized trees and they eat the cambium. They actually like scrape the, the inner cambium off using their teeth. And it sometimes kills the tree. This is uh, Dave Hawk gave me this picture from over in Grays Harbor. These are bear killed trees. Well, it's a really interesting tidbit that it's thought that the mama bear teaches their babies this behavior, but not all bears do it. 
only some bears do it. And apparently it's a minority, but in some areas, and ask Ken Miller about this, there's a lot of bear damage where they're, they're thinning these stands on behalf of uh, eating cambium. So here's a bear killed tree. Here's Mike Nystrom showing me one over by uh, Chehalis. Um, and so this is an interesting behavior because what are you gonna do about this? Well, they actually, timber industry actually tried feeding programs for years. So the idea was in the early spring, we're gonna give bears an alternative to trees. So they literally put uh, barrels of bear chow out there um, and even jelly donuts and such. But, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing because a couple of things, one, you train the bear to eat human food and Two, you probably actually augmented the bear population by helping survival. So these these programs have mostly been discontinued. Patrick, you could correct me on that, just as they're not cost effective. It really wasn't necessarily giving the outcome. So WDFW uh, will trap bears. Uh, sometimes if they're a big problem, sometimes they will relocate them. Sometimes they will euthanize them. Unlike cougars, they do... Uh, put remove bears sometimes and it varies a lot according to one of my friends at wdfw depending on the circumstance the location etc cetera, etc cetera. and you know if you do catch the bear or kill the bear how do you know you got the right bear and so that's one whole issue with lethal removal or even relocation is you don't necessarily know that you got the bear that was eating your trees so with bear damage that's a really gnarly situation pun intended um you could you know use the chain link fence it'd be really hard to do so bear damage uh, there's been some interesting articles written about it if you if you encounter it uh I got a, a contact here for you later. Okay, so beavers, beavers being the uh, classic tree eating creature, uh, large mammal, you know, all of us know their ecological role. They create wetlands, they raise water tables. We're learning a lot about beavers these days that their ecological effects are probably uh, disproportionately positive because of what they do to the water tables. And, and generally fish can get around the dams at some point. Um, and so they're, they're a really remarkable creature, but they eat trees and they also build with trees. And I bet you just about everybody in participating in this webinar has had some experience when the, you know, the damn beavers come in and start chewing down your cottonwoods. And it's like, wait a second, and then they eat the tops and there you go. So what are your options? Well, the beaver remedy, uh, the, the best ones are some kind of armoring. Once again, when they start working on a tree you really want, if they uh, plug up a culvert, you can do this sort of thing. They do these beaver deceivers. There's all these different methodologies. Well, something that's happened consistently across the state, this is a, this is a legal live trap for a beaver in a relocation project, um, is that if you uh, have beaver issues, they're probably going to be back. So this is a great organization, relatively recent, beaversnorthwest.org, and they are dedicated to helping people learn to deal with beavers well, in other ways besides just always uh, removing them. Um, oh, I meant to say this. So something about beavers is the populations in the state have continued to expand for, for multiple reasons. But one of them is that trapping uh, just doesn't happen that much anymore. How many, how many people in this room know a trapper? Probably hardly anybody. And if you do, it's a professional uh, you know, animal control guy person. Um, and the fur market is really diminished. And so beavers uh, have been expanding. And if you have good beaver habitat and you remove the beavers, they will be back there will be a beaver show back up on your property. So your best options are to figure out how to live with them. Beavers Northwest can really help give you some guidance on that. Voles and rabbits, little chewing rodents down low to the ground, tend to do stuff like this. That's a vole, not a mouse. Um, short tail, little teeny eyes. And uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, cottontail rabbits, we have those in many parts of the state. Snowshoe hares would be the, the uh, resident a hare, not a rabbit, and they would chew higher and bigger. And this isn't that common, but it does happen. Um, if you have issues in young trees, uh, one thing I like to, to recommend is you can do a, I call it a predator assist. You could make sure you have perches for owls in particular, because how does an owl hunt? 
It's a perch hunter. Just about all owls will land somewhere and stand there and listen and look for their prey. And they really eat a lot of small mammals. You could try some nest boxes for, for owls, kestrels. Doesn't work that often, but it can work. Um, you can try these tubes on certain plantations like this setting right here. We've got a planted cedar in tall grass. This is looking for vole trouble. And so this was an NRCS project uh, where they had put the short tubes on there. And I, I asked about, well, what about deer browse? Well, this area right here did not have a lot of deer, which was just kind of weird. So you might say, well, don't you need both tubes? You might, but they're going to find out. So there you go. Other chewing control tactics. Uh, there's always talk about poisons. I just, this is a personal bias, but it's beyond that, that uh, broadcast poisons always have collateral damage. You're going to kill things that you didn't intend to kill. Um, there are some, some anticoagulants and such that claim to be not so broad based, but you know, if you can figure out other ways like traps, you know, you can use live traps. Um, you can use snap traps like the classic mouse trap. Um, you might catch things you didn't intend to. If you have a situation where you can actually see the animal that's doing the damage, I mean, shooting uh, is a very effective method to get a particular animal. You got him. You know that rabbit that was eating that tree, uh, you know, is the one you were after. Um, Let's see, I'm going kind of fast here. This is sapsucker damage. A sapsucker is a type of a woodpecker that has this really interesting life history where they select trees, where they go across in this linear manner and they wound the tree through the bark so that the sap, you can see it right there a little bit, oozes out and then they eat the sap and they eat the insects that are attracted to the sap. Hummingbirds will come to these things too and eat the sap, but they don't open up the same holes every year. So they go back and they select the certain ones and it, it doesn't kill the tree. Um, it probably reduces its vigor slightly, but rarely does it actually kill the tree. And so the sapsuckers will come back to the same places. Some people think it's unsightly. I think it's cool, but um, oh yeah, there, here's your sapsuckers. Um, they, and they do make uh, cavities like other types of woodpeckers. Um, and really your only option is to armor that particular tree. So this was a fruit tree right outside of this house on uh, Vashon. And she had put just window screen and it worked. And so, yeah, there you go. So here's a summary of just your basic options for dealing with. First one is some kind of a barrier. If you can figure out, you know, which tree is which, the Vexar, the cage, the tubes, wire, um, just whatever version you got. Repellents, um, if used consistently, can be very effective. Uh, predator assist for uh, the rodents, the chewing rodents, the little guys, the, the voles, uh, maybe the rabbits could help. You know, that, that could actually be enough. Um, here's one too, I say predator assist, but you know, if you want to keep deer away from your, uh, your garden, you either put a fence around it or you let your dog out every hour. The problem with, uh, I don't, you notice I don't put harassment in here. And the reason I don't is because it's inconsistent. Um, I suppose there are some gizmos like the motion activated sprinkler that some people use on their gardens would be a type of harassment. So I probably should include that. But in general, it's inconsistent and you won't, you know, won't get your desired result. And then there's removal. You know, because we often will think, well, we need to get rid of that animal. And that would mean, yeah, you know, trapping, shooting, uh, not poisoning. That's the last results, last resort. And if you feel like after you've done your assessment, you really want to try to remove that animal. Let's say, let's say you have a beaver situation where you're just not willing to, to tolerate, you know, the amount of land or something. There are local services that uh, can help you with that. The, you know, the critter getter at Al. Um, uh, they might be able to relocate. Uh, check with your WDFW uh, local people. So, so if it's if it's a 
game animal like a rabbit i'd like a deer deer is a great example you can't just shoot the deer unless you had a damage permit from wdfw or a legal hunting license and the deer was in season and had you know the right number of points or whatever your local rules are um so just that and uh, relocating off of your own property without the permission of where you're taking the animal is technically illegal. But let's just say you put out a live trap and you caught um, the mountain beaver on your place. What are you going to do with it? Well, hopefully you know somebody uh, where you could take it. So just that, because because many of us who love wildlife and you've got a problem critter, you say, all right, I'll catch it and I'll take it somewhere else. So here you go. Here's the guy's name whose job is to deal with wildlife conflict issues. Dan Brinson, I got his permission to post his name on here. He's out of Ole. But, you know, <clears throat> the first place to start if you had a <clears throat> specific question about <clears throat> either legalities or uh, local, even local helpers, like who do I call? The WDFW has these regional offices, and I'm throwing this at WDFW because they are the entity responsible for wildlife management. So they all have a regional office. You could figure out where you are. That's the Olympia number, which will take you to this god awful phone tree. Um, but you can you can work with them and often get your answer. And when you find the right person, they're they're good to work with. And then lastly, you know, part of the reason to do this whole assessment is to see if it's really a problem. And you know, can you put up with it? Can you plant some extra trees? Um, there's this website if if, you're, if you want to really dive into animal damage, go to, to this thing right here. Patrick, I don't know, how do you share that so that people can keep it? Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. You just talk about the link there? Yeah. I'll just, I'll type it out. Don't worry Could about it. Could you type it out? Okay, good. Because yeah. that, that is like this rich source of information about uh, animal damage. And, and I say rodents right there because they have a whole bunch of different ideas of ways to deal with voles and things. And I mean, you know, it's not new stuff. So I, I, I guess I would, I, would, I would ask, you know, is it, is it something you can put up with? I mean, I go back to that picture of the bear stand. Well, shoot, that stand right there right now is well, two, 320 trees per acre. And the bears just took out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 25 trees. So, all right, now it's down to 340. Weren't you going to thin anyway? So that's it's it's, in, it's an interesting situation. The problem the problem with bears, the way that bears do it though, is they do it in a area, and so you might wind up with a little gap that you didn't want. So anyway, so that's just something. Um, yeah, here you go. Here's a fully stocked Douglas fir stand that could have undergone thinning by a bear and you wouldn't even notice 60 years later. So that's just an important thought. So when you're looking at a forest, I, 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 I always think stand dynamics in regard to where the stand's going to be in like 25 years which you can visualize. You can't visualize 100 years because who knows what's going to happen in 100 years. But you can anticipate what your action is going to move that stand towards in the order of a couple of decades. So I just think that's an important thing. And, you know, wildlife, to go back to that original point, is one of the great benefits of owning forest land. And, and dang it, they will. They'll eat our bushes. And we got we to gotta take them into account because I would suggest that a healthy forest includes wildlife and includes the full suite of native species that live well native or desired non-natives that live in your neighborhood and so that's all part of the deal so there it is so i got some photos from different friends here here's my contact information um by golly patrick i did it holy did. smokes <laughs> take a pause and, and breathe and uh yeah. <laughs> so for, ladies and gentlemen, for your information, I'm notoriously long winded and I'm, I'm always over time when we do these in person. So I have to. Uh, well, I, and, uh, and to be fair, this is a lot of information to cover in a half an hour, um, yeah, yeah. you know, so realistically, we could do an entire lunch break series just on animal damage. And maybe that's something we should consider, Kim. Well, you know, I, 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 I'm surprised that it's not as 
intent of a topic as I expected it to be. And the reason is that it's really localized. Mm -hmm. So like the fellow with the uh, tubes, with Doug Stinson, with the, the tubes on his, on his thing, that particular stand had really intense deer brows and he even had rabbits that were chewing on the trees. And so they were dealing with all these. And then you go somewhere else um, and say maybe Kit. Uh, Kit Ellis is probably a great example. I bet you Kit has... Uh, lots of deer browse on her planted cedars, but her trees are big enough that the bears leave the, the Doug firs alone because they're they're past that, you know, that phase. And so what happens with animal damage is people will be really focused on the places where it's intense enough that they that they need to take some kind of an action. And then they'll they'll often be uh, somewhat um, what's the word? they'll have kind of a conundrum about, you know, how to approach it, you know, how do I, what, what do I do? Um, and so, uh, yeah, there yeah. you go. Okay. What'd you just send there? What's Qualtrics, Patrick? That is a, thank you for asking. That is a link to a survey um, that I oh, would okay. really greatly appreciate all of you filling out. I'll also send that survey link out via email. Um, so if you don't get it here, you can get it there. Um, you know, like I mentioned a couple of times this week, this is a little bit of an experimental model and trying to, I think there's some calibrating necessary, right? The idea here would be going forward, we would cover more um, specific topics in greater depth. So like I just mentioned with Ken, we could do a whole week just on animal damage. So the survey is mostly to figure out, does this format work for you? Is this easier to attend? And is it easier to absorb information this way? And then also, what would you like to see covered in future sessions? Yeah, because um, you know, it, it, it will force us, the presenters, to really hard look at our rambling topic. And, <laughs> no, and, and like, what, you know, what's the nugget of it? And how could we, uh, what's the word, give people enough that if they really did want more information on, you know, a particular angle, that that's part of, I mean, honestly, that's part of what the outcome of the WSU DNR, the team, all, the conservation district, we're, we're a, a place to ask those questions um, that you might, you know, otherwise just Google up, but not be convinced that you got the right answer. Right. Yeah. Before we, um, before we end here, Bill uh, Wamsley, Hey, Bill. Uh, he's the noxious weed coroner for Lewis County. Um, oh, really? I want yep. some. So he asked about the roosting pole that you had. Yeah. What, what height? So, so Bill, um, you know, you think about the, I like to describe it as the attack angle of a raptor, say, say a red-tailed hawk or a barred owl, which are of a similar size. So it's going to be somewhere like in, like, somewhere, probably the longest attack angle would be somewhere in the order of 30 to 45 degrees, meaning where they, they came off of the perch and they had enough speed to be able to grab the, the vole or the mouse. And so we, we could do a little um, trigonometry and Mr. Greaser, my high school teacher, would be really happy to know that we could do this. But, you know, say like if the pole was 30 feet high, 45 angle out from that would be about 60 feet. So if you had a 30 foot pole, then you could sort of just say, okay, I have a 60 foot effect. And then you would put them that far apart. So say 120 feet apart for a 30 foot pole. Um, you know, but a dead tree works pretty good too. So if you had any scattered trees, you could girdle a tree and boom, now you've got your, your perch. Um, so the really the height honestly is what you could manage to get in the ground. If you had a tractor and some trees that you could use. And when you put them in the ground, it's more or less like installing a fence post. You know, I mean, I've, I've actually put a couple up just to watch birds by my bird feeder, but you put them in the ground like three or four feet. Um, and, you know, if you, you strip the bark off, if you want them to last a long time, do something to the base to, to discourage rot. But, you know, given uh, most forest landowners have lots of small trees to work with, something on the order of like three to, or no, let's say four to six inches in diameter, uh, 35 feet high that you could move with your quad or even by hand if you had to. Uh, leave a, a branch or two at the top. You don't need to put a T-post. Some people think, I mean, I'm sure the birds would like it, but if, if you've ever looked at birds perching on a, like a fence post, great example, they will sit right on 
the round thing, but I think they actually like like to have uh, something of a diameter that their feet will fit around. So yeah, yeah, there you go. That's right, Eric Wingren, I like this. He saves snags when he's logging and I think he'll strap a polar pipe to a fence post. Yes, that's a great idea, Eric. That is an excellent idea. Yeah, and they do use them. It's, it's, it's just cool. Totally, I mean, it totally makes sense. Yep, predator assist. And, and there are owls pretty much all over. And I actually think most of the uh, predation, not most, but a lot of it happens at night when we don't see it. And it's from owls. Hmm. Nice. Great. Well, um, if there's any other questions, you know, feel free to reach out to Ken. He's got his email yeah. there. I know he's always yeah. willing to, to talk via email or chat on the phone. Absolutely. Um, so everybody um, come, so come take coach planning when we offer it in person again. Oh yeah, those those will be the days when we can do something in person again. That'll be wonderful. <laughs> okay, well, thanks again, everybody, for joining along this week. Uh, I hope you all have a great weekend. Again, please, um, I'll send out that survey link in, in an email as well. It's also in the chat box here. Um, but please, you know, give us your thoughts and yeah, have happy holidays. If, Patrick, uh, were these to you sooner? Patrick, were these recorded where people could watch them later? Yep, I'm recording this one and I, I recorded all of them. I'll, I'll upload them to YouTube after this. I should send them out maybe by the end of the day or maybe early next week. Nice. Excellent. Well, thanks for having me, everybody. And I look forward to uh, seeing you next time. All right. Thanks again, Ken. Okay, Talk Patrick. to you later. See you, bud.